All right, so welcome back, everyone. We got, got outside and get a little fresh air for a moment. Uh, we're going to start our next session on health beliefs. As Marcy stated earlier this morning, we developed pension beliefs and investment beliefs, and now we're going to make uh, it only makes sense that we now look at developing a set of health beliefs. So this is an effort that our chief health director, Liana Bailey Crimmins, suggested we pursue a few months ago. So we're uh, who better to lead us off in this discussion than Liana herself? Great. It's all yours. Good morning, Mr. President and members of the board. It is a pleasure to present to you today the first draft of the CalPERS Health Beliefs. Over the past two months, the team has been engaging our stakeholders through face-to-face -face meetings, surveys, and to also ensure that we weren't missing anything, we went back several years and looked at other surveys and employer assessments to make sure that what we are presenting to you today reflected the pulse of our stakeholder um, groups and our, our efforts to this point. As a reminder, beliefs are the lens with which we see everything, and it allows us to achieve long-term objectives. It provides a consistent framework for decision-making, and it also ensures that we're building upon our successes. CalPERS has been very successful in its health program, so things that we want to do is to make sure that we're building upon those successes. With me today is a great panel of um, individuals that have worked really hard. We have David Cowling, who will be presenting on the data that we've collected. We have Karen Polish and Fabiola, um, who will also be talking about the perspectives that we've been looking at, the lenses. The, um, they've done all the hard work on pulling together the, the uh, pamphlets that you received today, and also facilitating the discussion around the healthcare beliefs and the, um, the uh, strategies that we're going to be presenting today. One of the things that we wanted to do as a framework is to ensure that a belief statement must be memorable. If we want it to be a consistent um, form of a framework to make decisions, we need it to be the forefront of our thought process. So because of that, we wanted to make them somewhat easy to remember and then impactful. When we talked to the retirees, the retirees said, you know, make sure that they're not watered down. We want these belief statements to be something that made a difference. And then when we talked to the labor associations, they said, use the tools that you have within your tool belt to make sure that the decisions and the changes that CalPERS can influence are the ones that are best suited for CalPERS. And so because of that, we wanted to make sure that the strategies that we've put in front of you today are as impactful as possible. And then again, leveraging the, the successes that we've had to date, we think it's extremely important um, that we continue to respect and value our history. From a timeline perspective, today we're going to be talking about dialogue and getting your feedback. Um, we, want you, we want to hear from you of what you like about what you see today, but we also want to know where there are areas for improvement. This is the first time we've presented them to you. And so based on the feedback, we will then be taking notes. And then hopefully, as we get closer to September, we'll take those changes, refine the, do, the uh, strategies and belief statements, and then bring them back to you for either a vote up or vote down in September. But I wanna do a caveat. This is a very important milestone for us, and because of that, if for some reason we need to take longer and we don't get through everything today, that is okay and we can work with you on extending the timeline. And then from an approach perspective, we met with a lot of groups of individuals. And it was interesting, when you go through an effort like this, you make assumptions and then you validate those assumptions. One of the things that Karen will be talking to you is about perspectives. As we talked to the retirees, we had a lot of discussion about patients. And patients can be retirees or actives. But we also looked at, in order to be a retiree, at some point you needed to be an active employee. And then in order to be an active employee, you also have to have that symbiotic relation with the employer. So our role as a purchaser is extremely um, valuable. And so with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to David Cowling, who's taken all the data from all the face-to-face -face surveys and historical, and let him tell us what he's seen and what trends that he'd like to share with us today. Thank you, Liana. Um, my team reviewed previous materials, including documents from the Health Benefits Purchasing Review Project in 2012, which led to the 21 health initiatives uh, and all the source documents from that process. In addition, we reviewed the public agency health benefit design needs assessment in 2014. That survey uh, it goes by the real snappy acronym of PAHABNA. <laughs> um, so we reviewed that, and then also all the other face-to-face -face materials that we had. Um, 
out of that process, we came up with 13 different themes and descriptions, and that's uh, in this handout that you have that lists these 13 themes and their descriptions. Please note that these themes aren't mutually exclusive. Um, there are things that cross over, these themes cross over from into each other. As an example, high quality care and affordability uh, surely crosses over into price and quality transparency. Also, you'll note that the top three te themes there are quite broad, and um, the other themes are kind of uh, strategies or services that feed into those top three themes. So what we did was um, we partnered with stakeholder relations to create a survey to get feedback from our stakeholders on the pr how to prioritize these 13 themes or what people thought about these 13 themes. And what we did was we sent out the survey to about 40,000 active and retired members, about 8,000 uh, employers, and note that although we only have about 1,200 employers that contract for, with us for health benefits, we sent it out to everyone who receives the employer bulletin. In addition, we sent it out to nine retiree associations, 22 labor associations, and 20 employer associations. Um, in addition on the survey, we asked for them to prioritize the 13, but we also had an open-ended question at the end where they could provide other suggestions about, um, so other category, and they could prioritize that as well. A lot of the feedback we received um, kind of ver were variations or fell into the other 13 themes. Um, in addition, uh, we got some kind of more general health uh, ideas, things like single payer, which was very common when this survey in the news, it was very common in the news when we sent that survey out in uh, late May. So this is the ranking of those themes from the stakeholders across all of the stakeholders. Um, we, saw, we see those three broad-based themes bubbled up to the top, high quality care, affordability, and comprehensive care. Um, underneath that, we see these kind of strategies and services uh, were the next set of variety of choice, cost containment, and quality of customer service. And at the bottom, you see the th three uh, other kind of strategies, um, which interestingly kind of came out from that 2012 uh, um, process and was surveys from the board themselves. So that process, kind of these kind of bubbled out of that. Um, but these were kind of lower priorities or themes for the, um, the stakeholders. And those were innovative health benefits, policy leadership and advocacy, and strategic partnerships. Do the colors have any meaning? They don't, other than okay. uh, trying to help us guide the which were green or red, you know, in terms of lower priorities. Yep. Um, so as we see that this is the uh, average across all of the different six stakeholder groups. In addition, we produced a, um, a different handout which provides the uh, rankings for each of the stakeholder groups. Um, I, I was actually surprised about how consistent it was across the, especially the first page, I'm sorry, the first page which included the active, retired, and employer groups. There was a lot of consistency in terms of the rankings or the prioritization amongst those groups. Uh, the second page includes the associations for the retiree association, the employer association, and the labor groups. There we see a little bit more variation amongst the prioritization. And it's hard to tell there if it's truly different in prioritization or if it's because the sample sizes that we got were fairly small. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Karen. It if I may. Go ahead. Is this the same as the one in the iPad? Thank you. So you may remember. You might remember. Is it on now? You might remember when we started the discussion about healthcare beliefs that we talked about lenses, our perspectives. And when you think about CalPERS as a purchaser, we actually have what you might consider a compound lens because we need to consider the diverse and varied uh, perspectives of all of our stakeholders in order to make the appropriate decision for the program as a whole. So you'll see here on this slide that we don't just have the typical purchaser, employer, and member that we hear quite often. We also included legislature, 
uh, patient, physician, and even the health plan carrier. It's really important that CalPERS consider all of these perspectives when we make our decisions, because as I said, everything needs to happen for the good of the entire program. But it's also really important um, based on what David just commented about in terms of the stakeholder rankings of the themes. It's really interesting that the bottom three themes, which were the innovative health benefits, policy leadership and advocacy, and strategic, strategic partnerships. When you look, talk to our stakeholders, they actually came up with high quality care and affordability as their top items. That actually makes a lot of sense because we all want affordable benefits and we all want high quality care. But when we apply our purchaser lens, we know that when you do things like innovative benefits, when you create strategic partnerships, and when you advocate for the right policies, these are the avenues that are going to get you to those high quality benefits at affordable prices. So you're going to see as we move through this process that while those themes didn't make it to the top of the rankings, they are incorporated in the strategies that are uh, buried within the beliefs themselves when we get later on into the present. Presentation. So when you look at today's process, we're going to be thinking about what do we use the beliefs for? What, what's the use for CalPERS staff? How would we decide when it's appropriate to respond to a comment letter request? When should we uh, engage on legislation? So that's just a, a peek at what we expect the beliefs to help us with. We're actually going to walk through today five draft beliefs with associated strategies. And the strategies, as I mentioned, they include some of the items on the themes, but they also incorporate a lot of what we heard from our stakeholders. Um, when we talked to employers and to the retiree associations, we got a lot of really great feedback that we incorporated into the strategies themselves. When we walk through the beliefs, you're going to see that there's three to six strategies on each one. In the interest of keeping the beliefs as something that is uh, short and concise enough that we use them, we would like to keep it at about six strategies per belief if possible, because we want to be using the beliefs on a regular basis. If we go through this work and then they sit on the shelf, they're not as helpful. So the idea is to keep them memorable and fairly easy to use. Um, for today, we want to spend about 10 minutes on each of the beliefs with its associated strategies, and we invite feedback and discussion on what you like and what you would like to add or change about each of the beliefs. And then we would uh, take that back, as Leanna mentioned earlier, and we'll update our documents and our beliefs for our September workshop. Before we actually get into reading the beliefs themselves, I wanted to just tie together the considerations that we took when we developed the beliefs and the strategies, because I think they'll be really beneficial for you as you're walking through uh, the beliefs with us and providing us your feedback. You can see here that the themes is one of the considerations, and David actually mentioned that earlier. You have three handouts. They're actually also on your iPad. We gave you paper copies so you can lay them out if you'd like to refer to them. There's the themes document that has each of the themes with a description of the theme. Then there's stakeholder feedback, and stakeholder feedback includes quite a few things. So we did a survey back in 2011 and 12 as part of the Health Benefits Purchasing Initiative that had quite a bit of work um, with stakeholders, including a survey that, as David mentioned, led to the 21 Health Benefits Initiatives. We had the Public Agency Health Benefit Design Needs Assessment in 15 that included a survey of our stakeholders. We have the survey that we just completed on the healthcare beliefs. And then we had outreach. So we did roundtables with employers and with our retiree associations. And I wanted to mention here that when we did the outreach with the employers and the retirees, we were very much rewarded to see that when we ran through the stop, start, keep exercises with our stakeholders, although they brought specific actions and tasks forward that they would like to see us do or start or maybe change, everything they said to us actually aligned very well with the, the themes that we have in our survey. That made us feel very good about the place we're in in terms of what we asked our stakeholders to rank for the beliefs.
The last handout that I wanted to show you is, um, let's see, it's titled Healthcare Beliefs Transitions. It's in your packet. It includes the legislative guidelines that Legislative Affairs Division brought to the board at the January offsite, and they were approved in February. Those guidelines would be retired after the beliefs are adopted. We also have federal health care priorities that were approved in March that would also be retired when the health care beliefs are put into place. In the middle column, you'll see guiding principles. That actually came from the health benefits purchasing review work. And you'll see in those two columns that these two activities, the legislative guidelines and the guiding principles, they include things like um, promoting proposals that encourage competition or uh, increasing affordable access to health care. And in the principles, we have things like engaging on wellness and prevention. And you'll see these things bubbled up through the strategies in the belief statements later on. When you look at this particular document, you can see that there's uh, rose white gray, white, gray. So the items that are in the white row for the legislative and the guidelines, those are what we considered when we developed the belief that's on the left hand there. So just sort of how we were thinking about things as we progressed through the process. Another thing we considered were the prioritization of the themes by our stakeholders. So in the deck, you saw the aggregate prioritization of the themes. And then in the handout you have with the stakeholder groups, it has prioritization of the themes by each of the stakeholder groups. So I thought those would just be handy things for you to have there to be able to glance at when you're providing your feedback and thinking about what would be uh, beneficial in the belief statements themselves. The last consideration, it's not on the slide, but I think it's important to think about what the beliefs will do for CalPERS going forward. When we develop the belief statements, the idea is that these will help us in decision making and it's decisions around proposals to accept, uh, benefits to align or change or offer, um, things like do we want to add another basic plan, like with the Western Health Advantage, or do we want to add another Medicare Advantage option? Um, from a benefits uh, perspective, do we want to add something or maybe expand something like the silver sneakers for our Medicare members? Ideally, you would be able to take that <clears throat> idea or proposal and run it through the beliefs and the strategies and see how well it aligns with what CalPERS health program believes. See which boxes you can tick off. If it aligns really well, then obviously that's something we're going to want to pursue. Or maybe it's a great idea, but it doesn't align today and maybe it's not the right thing for us right now. So we think that this would be really beneficial going forward as folks in the health program are trying to make decisions, even on things as easy as whether we comment on a, a federal comment letter. Um, you know, if we had guidelines, it would be a lot easier to tell, yes, this is appropriate for our program, or no, this is not appropriate for our program. <clears throat> so at this point, I think we've kind of gotten to how we were thinking when we developed the beliefs. So we want to walk through each of the five beliefs with their associated strategies, and we'll read through the actual belief and the strategies and ask for your feedback and discussion. We'll watch the clock and try to spend 10 minutes. And if that's not enough time, then we can you know, reassess when we get to that point on terms of the conversation. So if when you think of the first belief, we're thinking affordability here. And when we think affordability, of course, it has a different meaning to each of our stakeholders. When we talked to our employers, they had a lot of concerns around the overall cost of health care, especially when you consider the potential for the excise tax to still come into play. And then when we talk to our retirees, you know, it's out of pocket costs. It's, you know, do I have a premium that's more than what my employer contribution is? Once you're on that fixed income, you're very price sensitive. So it has a different meaning in each and every space. So to walk us through the actual belief statements and their strategies, Fabiola is going to do that for us. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and read the first belief statement. Healthcare, healthcare affordability is a shared interest and the strategies associated with this belief is to manage and sustain reasonable out-of-pocket out of costs for members. Premiums matter to both employers and members. Additional costs must represent value add. Leverage competition and negotiating power to contain medical and pharmacy cost drivers. Innovative benefit designs reduce cost and to confirm the eligibility of members receiving the benefits. And at this time, we can open it up for discussion and feedback. 
once again, we would like to hear from you what you Teresa? what you like and. Go ahead. Thanks, you guys. I did really care. <laughs> um, the only thing I had on belief one, I had a question, and then I thought I would add something, and that's up for everybody to decide whether or not. As you were moving from um, the legislative guidelines, guiding principles to belief statements, we dropped off the word increasing, and I think we still should keep that because I think that's a, a struggle. Increasing healthcare affordability is a shared interest. I think we need to continue to work on that because it's a struggle. And <coughs> excuse me, you spoke about the retirees um, talking about you know at, at, on on a fixed income. Well, we've got a lot of employees. I have an employee that has five children, and and those copays add up. So if you raise those copays, if the insurance copays go up those add up so I think increasing would be helpful that's my input and that's up to the board of course and then I my question is the last thing on the strategies was confirm eligibility of members receiving benefits obviously that's a cost containment measure um, I don't know how I'm, I'm not sure we need it here because I think it's a, kind of assumed I just I seems like it's almost um, offensive. It can be, our members and our retirees. And, and what I remember when we went through the whole, I got lots of questions like, why would they even do this? I know that we saved a ton of money, but I don't know that we want to advertise that out in the public, maybe. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. So uh, we have an ongoing eligibility requirement right. for the retirees through CalPERS and the actives through CalHR. Um, when we were thinking of this, we were thinking of that obviously, but also general rules and guidance around what you should provide to get a, a dependent on in the first place, have a little more clarity. So I'm wondering if maybe it's about reword. wording, yeah, maybe, maybe we maybe. should reword and, and talk a little bit more about clarity around eligibility that rather than a good idea because it sounds more accusatory right and we don't want to go there yeah. <laughs> thank you um so on on this first one i think it's important to say it's a shared interest between whom <laughs> is it between are you suggesting here that it's between the employer and the member or, the, or you know the active or the retiree or are you saying it's a shared interest societally or um you know so i guess i think that i think that having some more specificity would be useful um and then under strategies i i i guess i think um some of these are high level strategies and some of these are like very specific tasks and we should be clear about what, you know, we should we should keep them a little bit higher level. And then the, the so, for example, the eligibility, that to me is just sort of appropriate management of the program and maybe doesn't really isn't really a strategy as much as it is one of the things that we do to manage the program. Um, I, I One thing that I see is missing here is leveraging strategic partnerships and federal and state policy advocacy, which are both really essential to achieving affordability in my in my opinion, um, so so th those are my those are my preliminary comments. Thank you. We do address them later, but I agree that they are um, integral to affordability. So it's worth adding. So what I'm hearing is consistent voice through the strategies. Don't be too. I mean, if we're at a high level, stay high level. Some of these may uh, reflect more operational tactics, things that we do on a on a, op on a day to day type of basis. So keeping them high level, and then. Like any belief statements, what are who are we doing? That, you know, who are who's impacted? So just saying it's a shared interest maybe leaves it too open ended, and so really just defining who that that who we're who's, whose interest are we talking about here? If I hear you correctly, Priya. Okay. Thank you. JJ. Uh, I I would agree that healthcare is a shared interest, but I think this is our statement of beliefs. And I think that, at least speaking for myself, I believe it's not just a shared interest, it's a right. 
And part of the reason we exist is to help our members obtain that. I think it's a right, it's not just a shared responsibility. So I would actually make it a stronger statement. Um, the other comment I would make is the innovative benefit designs reduce uh, costs. And one of the things that I have consistently said is, you know, if you provide less benefits, it's a, the premiums are less. For some reason, insurance works that way. And again, I fear that that may be an opening for a high deductible plan, which is, I don't see this board ultimately adopting it. I mean, there may be some contentions about it, but um, so I'm not sure that I disagree with the language, but I think it needs to be very clear that that is not opening the door to the high deductible plan. Richard? And Richard's gonna say the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, regarding shared interest, um, I, I don't think we should make it more specific because if we sort of uh, provide a list of, of who those stakeholders are, I think we need to include the taxpayers because uh, they, they have a vested interest in, in maintaining the cost of these healthcare plans is they have to foot the bill for the majority of it. Uh, so I, I'm fine with it as is. Regarding eligibility, um, well, I don't necessarily agree with Ms. Taylor that it's offensive. Uh, it, it is a statutory requirement that we revisit this every three years, both on the retiree side and the active side. So I don't think it's necessary for us to uh, include statutory requirements in here or, or the list could get rather long. Thank you. Michael. Bill. Uh, thank you. Um, just for, uh, and I agree with uh, Richard, that I think leaving it general, it's a shared interest. I mean, otherwise, we go down a rabbit hole. Um, is this on? Mm -hmm. Okay. On, on the strategies, uh, I, I'd just like to have us have consistency. So in some cases, you have verbs. Mm -hmm. In other places, you have statements. So let's do one or the other. Either it's a, a command to do something or it's a statement of belief, but let's have consistency across it. And, and I, I also agree that uh, confirm eligibility is a task um, that has statutory implications. So I don't think it belongs at this level. Thank you. Alan. Thank you, Rob. Uh, in deference to the last two comments, I appreciate how challenging it is to keep this high level and not get too detailed. Karen, I really appreciated your walk through the evolution from the guidelines and the, uh, the reference. So when we did the guidelines, we had some references to prescription drug uh, costs and such, and it gets down into the uh, belief related to affordability and the strategy is leverage competition and negotiate pattern, et cetera, et cetera. Since you laid out the notion that this is a guidance document for staff for policy making, does that mean that we only support policies that support our ability to leverage and negotiate? They're sort of CalPERS centered? Or do we support anything that has a systemic impact on costs through somebody else's leveraging and negotiation? Thank you, Mr. LaFaso. So that is actually something we would love input on. It's a question we struggle with regularly. Do we advocate for everyone? Do we advocate for California? Do we advocate only for our members? So guidance from the board in that regard would be very much appreciated. It's always something we struggle with because of our voice in the marketplace. We're asked to participate on many different levels and it's always a question of appropriateness. So that would be something we would love to hear from you all on. Just to respond and be balanced, it seems to me the two issues are one, we have a lot of a lot of activities when we are, are ourselves a market actor. And we have another set of activities where broader systemic regulation impacts the environment within which we are acting as a market actor. In other words, it relates to us, it relates to us indirectly. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm putting forth, yes, the idea that we should support both. And if that should be explicit for the benefit of staff's guidance, so be it. Hoping you'll respond about specificity. Thank you. So that actually, um, it's a recent example. So we put out a comment letter 
um, in response to the federal government's request for information around the health care law repeal and replace. And we've made two separate comment letters in this area recently. And we did actually include that although CalPERS is a large group market purchaser, we are downstream affected by what happens in the individual market, right? So if there's huge changes to the individual market and there that leads to more uncompensated care that can have downstream impacts, so that secondhand impact. So we would we would love to have that clarity. I, I like what I'm hearing because it feels like that's a lot clearer um, direction for us in terms of when do we step in and when we don't step in. So you know, to the degree that we should get specific in the strategies, I'd love to hear feedback on that too. I'm not sure. We were trying to keep them very high level. So um, we can absolutely develop policy under the strategies or initiatives under the strategies that get to the specificity. Um, Mr. LaFosso, yeah, that, that's what we would actually create procedures or policies below that that would define. Um, we're just trying to keep this more at a high level. <clears throat> Teresa? Sorry, go ahead. I stole it from you. So I'm glad you guys asked that because I was a little concerned about that as well. One of the reasons that I think um, Ms. Mother originally asked for the healthcare beliefs was we were trying to figure out our strategies moving forward with our federal and state healthcare representatives. So in stating that, I think it's important, and Ms. Mother can also you know, weigh in, but I think it's very important that we include everyone at some point in our belief statement and or strategies, because as you said, Karen, we are downstream. So when they are going to, as far as I can see, they're going to take a vote on repeal today. If that were to take place, we go back to the original marketplace, and that is where we had double-digit increases every year over and over. So we, so any impact federally impacts our members. The same goes with drug pricing. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to start, you know, signing on to letters and, and working with strategic partnerships to impact and help lower the cost of health care, then we need to be taking it as a whole, is my opinion. So I just wanted to throw that in there since you are kind of asking for that. I think that would be very helpful and I thought that was what this was kind of all about to begin with. Thank you. Also, uh, just a time check. We've gone a little over 10 minutes. Do we want to continue on this item or move on to the next? We've got Mr. two more questions or okay. comments. Ron? Thank you. With respect to the most recent discussion around our advocacy and our work around uh, just CalPERS or beyond, I think it's it's important for all the reasons that have been stated that we we do look at the, the broader universe of healthcare. And I'd point out that when we developed our pension beliefs, we had the very same discussion and ultimately decided that it is our role, given our size, that we're, we're leaders for the, the overall universe, in that case around pensions and defined benefits, and I think in this case around healthcare, it's it's important. Full disclosure, I'm one of the few people in the room that's not part of the CalPERS health system, but I you know I, I do think it's it's important for a whole variety of obvious reasons. The second, on an earlier issue that Bill brought up around um, consistency and the strategies, and, and the one I'm looking at is innovative benefit designs reduce co cost. That's not really a strategy, it's a statement. I think maybe something more appropriate would be explore innovative benefit designs that may reduce costs, might make more sense. Thank you. Priya? Well, Ron basically said what I was going to say, that it, that under pension beliefs, number 11 says that CalPERS should advocate for retirement security for America's workers and for the value of defined benefit plans. <laughs> and I think we should do have a, something similar on the health beliefs, that as a leader, CalPERS should advocate for retirement, for health security for America's work workers and f for the value of value-based designs or something something corollary, um, I think would be reflective of, of our beliefs. So Ms. Mother, are you recommending that maybe we change it from healthcare affordability to exactly what you were just talking about, the shared interest or having a, a separate um, belief statement exactly that aligns I think to that it? might be, I think that would be a separate okay. belief, an, an additional right. belief to the All ones right. that have been listed. Thank you. Okay, we're ready for the next one. 
Do we want to quickly summarize just so that we make sure um, of what we No. OK, we'll keep going then. OK, moving on to belief statement to belief statement number two. Uh, this belief is about access. When we met with our employers back in May, we had uh, about three to four employers from Napa. And they actually expressed that they wanted more health plan options for their employees. I'm pretty sure there's more employers that actually want this. And with those, uh, with that feedback, we actually developed this belief statement and a strategy. So uh, just wanted to give you the background on this belief statement. I'm gonna go ahead and read belief statement number two. Access to appropriate timely care benefits, benefits all. And the strategies associated with this belief are to offer a wide selection of benefit designs, to provide a variety of choices among health plans, services, <clears throat> and benefits, to strive for ample provider access within the member service areas, to promote essential health care services across the spectrum from primary care doctor to specialist and to, to hospital care, and to promote timely access to appropriate care. And with that, I will open it up for discussion and feedback. Richard? Um, thank you, Rob. I, I, the next, the second to the last bullet under the strategies, I, I'm not sure what that means, and it seems a little too wordy uh, in the sort of <coughs> overall framework of what we're trying to work on here. So I don't know if that needs to be <laughs> clarified or split out into separate <coughs> items or, or something, but I don't know, it just strikes me as out of place, and it's not clear what we're trying to say, at least to me. Bill? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the first two bullets, uh, I, I'm not sure I see the difference between them. Uh, I think they're saying the same thing in different ways. So maybe you can add some yeah. explanation. For the first strategy on wide uh, selection of benefit designs, that's more around like if we in the future we in the future we wanted to add a high deductible plan tiering, whatever that may be. That's just a wide selection of benefit design. For the second strategy, it's more about adding more plans. So adding more plans, more more services. I know, I'm still having difficulty seeing the difference between the two. If you just said provide a, a variety of choices among health plans, benefits, and services, does it not incorporate number one? I think that, <clears throat> Mr. Slayton, it was really perspective. So the first one was much more from the employer's perspective about wanting different options in terms of actuarial value within our plans mm -hmm. and cost sharing within our plans. And the other one was about right, access through networks and gotcha. enough doctors and um, enough providers available to for the okay. member to get to the doctor. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Teresa? Yeah, we do. Thanks, you guys. Um, let me... This one kind of confuses me. So as I look at the belief itself, access to appropriate timely care benefits all. And I'm wondering if we want to put, I would like to see the word universal access. But I think Priya kind of covered that in adding a an entirely separate belief. So that doesn't necessarily have to be there. But access to health care benefits all? What is appropriate and timely to me? Mr. And I don't even see it addressed. So when we talk about appropriate, we were thinking more along the lines of the uh, right care, right time, right cost. So uh, high value care rather than low value care leading into that entire discussion. So it's more about the quality. Appropriate would be the quality care. And timely is uh, we actually survey our members around their ability to get appointments quickly. Uh, access their doctors quickly, so that would be the timely piece. So the appropriate care when you need it. Okay, does that also include our rural areas? Because I guess it's here in your in your strategies. Definitely, yes. That actually they are probably one of the loudest voices around the access and to appropriate care because they are rural and there are less. Uh, providers available, so they actually do have a pretty high concern around this area. Okay, I'm I, I'm going to leave that open to the board, but I th somehow I'm appropriate because you could that could be access to high value, low cost, right? Or or it could be access access to health care because in our rural areas they don't necessarily even have that. 
the word appropriate is just not ringing. It's just um, to me, it's not ringing. That um, I just think it should be access to healthcare benefits all, and then you can go into it with the strategies. Okay. Talking about, I think one of your your overarching strategies could be the appropriate timely issue. Thanks. Priya. What I'm struggling with is this question of variety of choices. Uh, you know, we have recently moved to have expanding the number of health plans that we offer. But to me, the, the number of plans is, a, is partly a strategy to get to appropriate, sufficient coverage across the state and um, to get to cost containment <coughs> if we can promote competition between the plans. And so we use that as a strategy to get perhaps, but it might not be the strategy that we, that persists. It might not be the strategy that we think ultimately down the road is going to be the right ones. I guess I, I, I struggle with that variety of choices as being um, so, so strong <laughs> in here that it, that it might, it might be the strategy that we think makes sense. But 10 years ago, we thought the strategy that made sense was to consolidate um, with one plan. And there might be some other strategy that comes up that we think um, makes more sense to to get th to the access and um, quality question and cost containment question down the road. So um, I, I, I don't know. I, I recognize that some of our stakeholders like the idea of variety and as many choices as possible and as much access as possible, but there are tensions between, potentially between having a variety of choice and the broadest possible access and the what best possible benefits and, um, and the cost perhaps affordability piece, which is also very important. So um, there needs to be something about weighing the benefits of a variety of, I'm I'm not exactly articulating it that well, but I, I'm I'm just struggling with having it be so bold that we are going to do this, that we are going to provide a variety of choices. If that is the solution necessarily, I think I understand where you're going. Okay. And by putting that strategy, may limit us in the future. So exactly, I, I, I want us to explore whatever options there might be to deliver the best value for our members I, um, and and employers. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think probably one of the reasons it bubbled up amongst our stakeholders in the rural areas, there's not a lot of choice. Yeah. There's only maybe a PPO. And so I think maybe that was one of the reasons why it kind of elevated to the top more maybe than yes. some of the others. And I get that, but we don't also necessarily have so much control over whether there are HMO options in some of these rural areas where there are very few providers and, um, you know, we can't, you know, our plans cannot negotiate HMO solutions. So I get that that's a concern, and I, I, I it's a completely valid concern that there aren't HMO options in certain um, rural areas. But uh, anyway, I'm, I feel like we can reword that to something a little bit more appropriate. Okay, and then the essential hair health care services to me that's an advocacy that belongs in the p public policy advocacy piece that we believe that there are some essential benefits. This is sort of you know so, and that it doesn't really belong here unless we're talking about the essential benefits that we cover or sort of something around our preventive care coverage or, but uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I, maybe it's more of a question than a, than a conclusion. So I think we were just um, honestly aiming at the access to appropriate care would include all of these levels of care, promote the access to that care. So we may need to reword that. JJ. A couple of observations, you know, a wide selection of benefit designs. I mean, we have consciously said we're having two. We're, all the HMOs have the same benefit structure. The PPOs have essentially the same benefit structure. Um, and this says we're going to do something else. Now, it made Richard happy because he said after three years, they're finally listening to me on high deductible. Um, I won't be here, uh, but knowing my two the two people are running for my seat, there will be an advocate to avoid high deductible. Uh, but when I looked at this statement, it reminds me of the first set of statements we had on uh, investment beliefs. This really, you know, they were so generic, they said nothing. This really says nothing. This doesn't say what we believe in. Um, and so, um, 
yeah, I mean, access to appropriate and timely health care benefits all, and it benefits all if the sun rises in the east. Um, so I, I just don't know that this is really a belief because I'm not sure that it really says anything. Thank you. Alan? Thank you. Um, a couple follow-ups a little bit. So one, the last point, or essential health benefits does sound like it's language that came out of the Affordable Care Act. And I know if we were doing this 10 or 15 years ago, we'd say comprehensive. I'm wondering if the word adequate ought to be in the belief statement since bullet number four, strategy number four rather, seems to speak to that. Anyway, I'm just, just apropos to what Priya said, keeping it out of ACA language, but uh, two, um, this, this thing about choice, I, I mean, it's funny. I, I, do, I absolutely agree with Priya's strategy, although it's funny. I think sometimes when we increase the number of plans, it's really to increase the number of access to physician groups or providers. Um, plans are a means to an end. In fact, that's what we just talked about in the last hour, which is should we have a provider focus? M maybe just a higher reference to choice since sometimes plans is a means to an end. And But, but I, anyway, enough on that. La lastly, um, so I understood the difference between strategies one and two. And I guess I'll jump in the middle of the pool. It does look to me like strategy number one kind of alludes to high deductible health plans. And given the, in my opinion, the wide variety of stakeholders we have and the, the space that staff is seeking to explore all of the devices that add value. Maybe if that's what that statement means, wide selection of benefit designs, we just make an effort to say what's what we insist on benefit designs and where we're flexible. And I'll allude to the thing I referenced at the last session, which is as long as there are affordable alternatives for all members. Anyway, thank you. Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I'm looking at the last uh, strategy. It's almost like repeating the belief statement itself. Uh, I, I don't know if it's an actual strategy. I mean, the promote part, I get it, but I think four and five sort of are in the same boat there that we could somehow combine or reword even to have one from the two of them, I'm not sure, but it just seems like we're repeating the belief statement itself. Bill? Uh, two, two comments. Uh, first of all, the access to appropriate, and I think the word appropriate is very powerful in there because we're trying to make sure we do value-based, that we do get people the correct treatment that solves, addresses their issue um, so I think the appropriate is, is very important to be there. Um, and, and now that I look at the first bullet, I'm not sure when, when I, when I look at the stakeholder response, I, I'm not sure I see that first bullet in there. Uh, I, I think the second bullet really gets to the heart of the matter, which is making sure people have choices. Um, and, and to me, that's the more powerful issue rather than a wide selection of, of benefit design. That seems like the, you know, in, uh, inside baseball uh, speak uh, versus the second bullet. That's my comment. Okay, ready for the next one. Okay, moving on to belief number, belief statement number three. This belief statement speaks for it itself, it's about decision making. And, this, and the belief statement is decisions are made in the best interest of the program. And the strategies associated with this belief are, is our decision making considers the perspectives of all stakeholders, health plan accountability, and to collect sufficient premiums to pay for the cost of health care. And with that, I will open it up for discussion. Thank you, Priya. Yeah, so this is one I really struggle with because I don't think we're in this business for the, to be in the best interest of the program, but of the beneficiaries. And we, of course, also have to consider other stakeholders like the employers, for example. So um, I, 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 I think something more along the lines of, of like using terminology like sustainability of the program. This is really trying to get at 
this we, we want this program to be sustainable so that employers can continue to offer the benefits that we um, that we design and and purchase on their behalf and that members can afford to pay the premiums and or whatever share of the premiums and co-pays, et cetera, so that they can access the health care. So I think this is I think this is really getting at sustainability. And that's what the last bullet under strategies um, and maybe health plan accountability is also a piece of that. So I I I think the fir the belief statement itself needs to be reworked completely, and uh, I'm thinking about what it should say, but I don't have um, an exact suggestion right now. But something really around s sustaining the program, so, yeah, around sustainability. So, JJ, yeah, I also reacted very negatively to program. Um, we shouldn't be making decisions for the benefit of the program. We ought to be making decisions for the benefit of the members. Um, and if you change it to members, then it incorporates the employer because they kind of got to be part of it. But I would actually encourage members rather than program. Henry? I guess we all agree on the same thing. I had the same reaction on this one that uh, somehow that needs to uh, reflect the members' interests as a opposed to the interests of the program. So I think the comments, sustainability, I think for members uh, would work for me. Bill? Well, I'm gonna suggest given all the other beliefs that are in here, you don't need this one. Uh, I'm just, I see it as essentially redundant and, and the last bullet, collect premium sufficient to pay. I mean, we're either gonna run a program or we're not gonna run a program. So to me, that's operational. Uh, in consideration. So I, I would just advocate for dropping this one and enhancing some of the others. Ready for the next one? Moving on to belief statement number four. This uh, belief statement is about quality care and prevention. And I wanted to share a story uh, that some uh, one of our retirees actually shared with, the, with us. They actually put a different spin on on this belief statement. When we're healthy members, we think about affordability. A lot of us think about affordability. How much does it cost? But one of our retirees actually shared, when you're actually seeking services or receiving services, and when you have one of your family members or you yourself actually seeking services, you don't see it from the perspective of an active member, a retiree. You see it from the perspective of a patient. And it's when you see it from that perspective that you realize you want the best quality care. Regardless of whether it costs a million dollars, whatever it costs, you don't put a price on your health. So that retiree, you know, when he shared it, it gave me goosebumps and I said, that's right. Because when you're not seeking or receiving services, you, think of, you just think about affordability. And, but when you're the patient, it changes your perspective. It changes the way you see things, the plan you're gonna enroll in, and the providers you're going to actually seek. So with that, I will read belief statement number four. Quality care and prevention results in healthier members. And the strategies associated with that belief are to educate our members on cost and quality, pr to promote the use of transparency tools, deliver superior customer service, and to encourage the utilization of available wellness and disease prevention programs. And I will open it up for discussion. Teresa. I kind of feel like this is a this is good. I, I like this, but I, I I'm wondering quality care and prevention results in healthier members, and I'm wondering if we could. It's it seems kind of dialed down and you know drilled down, and I'm thinking more like affordable quality health care um, results in healthier members. Because when we look at affordable quality healthcare, we're looking at all of the strategies we're currently using, like BPD and and our HMOs and edu education. We're already using these strategies. So affordable to me, on the board, affordable quality healthcare makes he healthier members means all of that. We don't need to get into prevention. I don't think. I think that's more of a almost a operative of it is my opinion for you 
a couple of thoughts on this one. Um, the one piece that's missing from this is sort of the value add of having healthier mem actives for the employers. You know, we haven't talked at all about attrition, you know, not attrition, but um, absenteeism and, and, and issues like <coughs> that which are a drag for employers. And that might be something worth incorporating here. Um, and then I also think that the customer service piece, I'm not sure it belongs in this belief right. statement. I think it belongs really in number five, which is around stakeholder engagement. Um, because I'm not sure that customer service is directly correlated with quality care. I mean, I don't know where, maybe it's, are we talking about our customer service? Are we talking about the provider's customer service and how they, I, I, maybe that's where it's unclear, but um, the customer service piece, to me, uh, from CalPERS perspective anyway, it seems to be more connected to the engagement component. And so. On that first piece, would you say uh, healthier and productive members? Yes. Yeah, maybe something like that. Um, yeah. Michael? Uh, I'm curious, how do you define transparency tools? We were thinking about what currently exists, the, the cast light as an example, and then we have the Welby, and it could in the future encompass other things. But we also have the annual uh, report on the healthcare program that offers transparency into some historic information about the program, our chronic conditions and cost drivers. So transparency in a large sense, both your narrative you know, research tools and then your active looking for a service provider tools. Okay, so I'm on both our side and the provider side. Okay, yes. thank you. Dana? Yeah, oops. On this belief, um, I would just get rid of the prevention and say quality care re uh, results in healthier and productive members uh, because I feel that is put a lifestyle issue and it's not something that we but we don't dictate people's lifestyle. Thank you. Bill? Um, I, I think, and, and I know the other belief had the word uh, appropriate in there, but when we get to quality care, and Linnea, you know, we've had a discussion about the issue, of, particularly when you get into serious medical conditions and, and the ability for people to be able to navigate through the system um, and maybe the transparency tools is part of that. I don't know. But uh, to me, that's the expensive piece of, of medical care when people are facing life-threatening situations, whether it's a cancer diagnosis, whatever. Um, so I, I think that's where the quality and appropriateness of the care really gets to the heart of the matter of making sure someone uh, either stays healthy or gets healthy. Uh, so I, I guess the, the first bullet, educate members on, on cost and quality, is kind of, I, I kind of view that as a universal thing, you know, kind of across the health system. You know, where can you get good, appropriate care at a reasonable price? But um, the, the side of educating our members and retirees in navigation of the system to me is a, an important element that I'm not sure is captured in those strategies. So Bill, do you, do you think just saying educate members and leaving it more broad so we have more opportunity um, I, to expand to advocacy or other things that we might want to look at? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's more than in cost and quality. I'm not sure what the right words are, but uh, it's getting, you know, it for anybody who's had medical situations, you know, again, the, the earlier discussion of citizen versus patient, uh, you know, and the comment that you made from the retiree who said, no matter what the cost, I want appropriate care, but that requires navigating. And you're navigating from a position of weakness because you're not a medical professional. And yet you're trying to make decisions for your family that impact the whole system as well as obviously your either individual or family. So I'm trying to figure out, how, so I don't have a solution to this. I'm just kind of tossing it out as something I think we need to, we do need to pay attention to, to help our members. Priya. 
So um, it seems to me that the strategies are really folk that that are articulated here are really focused on what the individual can do. So what the healthcare, the patient or the consumer, healthcare consumer should be doing, but it doesn't actually talk much at all about the strategies from the provider that, that we might pursue with the provider to, to you know, so, so I, I mean, I think one of the strategies should be we will use um, performance measures to drive better, better health outcomes for our members. I think it just needs to be more, I don't know, <laughs> there needs to be more of the, of the uh, specificity. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with, with, the, with the language because it seems, it seems very general, and I don't see how it's going to really provide strong enough direction uh, right now. Alan? Uh, thank you. Actually, riffing off a little bit of what Priya just said, I'm wondering if you might want to split the beliefs up in a more system-focused one and a uh, more patient-focused one. Um, my, my earlier observations, I um, well, I actually really like what Bill said about the patient with the higher needs. And if we were in a much different context, you know, well, I won't use the word patient centered because that's a abused word now. But, you know, there are a lot of uh, in, you know, cancer groups, cancer patient groups and AIDS patient groups have a lot of words they use to describe, you know, patient driven system. I, I can't come up with the words, but there's a place there to get some of that, that language. But that speaks to the general notion of other aspects of the belief that are patient focused and a lot of the i i really was stuck on the use of the word transparency because that's a very narrow focus on transparency i think your response to michael's question expanded it but i remember when i got here in 2015 we had a some policy initiative that was on the table about and as a policy matter encouraging uh private health payers to have to provide more data so that the data we had as a system was more robust, which was a very high level focus on transparency. And maybe uh, maybe that's all been worked out voluntarily along the lines of what you know IHA talked about in the last session. But, but uh, uh, back to the 13 uh, themes, th that's what I saw in transparency. Um, and maybe transparency in the context of a more system-oriented belief, either on its own or, as I suggested, breaking the beliefs to a patient-centered and a system-centered. Anyway, thank you. JJ? Yeah, th this is another one of those statements that reminds me of the first investment belief statement. It is so general that it really doesn't say that much. Um, but the other, I want to react to Dana's comment about dropping prevention. Um, I think we've all come to realize prevention is important, um, and it's not just lifestyle. It's you know appropriate medical tests, it's appropriate care, um, and you know it. You know, dealing with diabetes is a lot cheaper than dealing with amputated legs. Um, so I think we don't want to lose prevention, but then I will go back to this whole, this statement is, you know, like our first investment belief, uh, which I actually give Priya credit for saying, this is so general, it's not worth it. Come back and do it again. Um, so that, that was my observation. All right, ready for the next one. Belief statement number five is about engagement and advocacy. The belief statement is two, is engagement promotes better outcomes. And the strategies are to continue involvement in strategic partnerships across the healthcare industry, educate members and employers on the Cal CalPERS benefits program in the healthcare industry, sustain a leadership role as a healthcare purchaser, advocate for effective policy changes at the state and federal level, and to act in the best interest of the health benefits program. And with that, I'll open it up for discussion. JJ? Your mic. Sorry about that, I turned it off. Um, I again would react to 
acting in the best interest of the health benefit program. It's about acting in the best interest of our members. Um, we need to always go back to focus the program on what is in the interest of our members, not necessarily what's in the interest of the program or the institution. It is our members. Thank you. Priya. Thank you. Um, I first of all, I think this one needs to be split into two. I think I've already um, mentioned that that uh, the, the engagement versus um, the engagement versus advocacy. I think they're two separate things. So engagement of our stakeholders and our members and uh, is is one and the healthcare industry broadly. Those are all. That's like one area of communication. And then there's. Um, or maybe engaging our stakeholders maybe and our members is one area and then engaging the healthcare industry that's more about leveraging partnerships and then there's advocacy which is real which might involve some element of partnerships but also um is really policy and legislative and i think so I, I think it needs to be split i don't think it can all be combined into one i also didn't react very well to the final strategy about act in the best interest of the health benefits program. That doesn't really say much to me. What is the best interest of the health benefits program? That's what these beliefs are trying to get at. And what, not really, not, and again, not what it's in the best interest of the program, but it's in the best interest of the members. And it's in the best interest of the members to have a sustainable program that is affordable, high quality, um, delivers better outcomes, where they have access to the care that they need to, at, you know, at, at the time that they need it. Though, so it's, um, so I, so I, yeah, so, I'll, I'll stop there. Richard. Thank you, Rob. Um, a, a couple comments. One, with regard to the last bullet, I, I think it's already been said, but that we, the, we already have a belief that's on, a statement that's on point with that. So I think it's, it's kind of silly to have it here as a strategy under a separate belief. And uh, I kind of agree with Priya. I think we've got too many things mixed into this one. Um, and then I had one other point. Well, well, just the overall point that engagement promotes better outcomes. I don't know that our track record has spoke to that with regard to the the providers, <laughs> uh, but I guess we can you know stick to our guns and hope for a better outcome in the future. Alan, uh, thank you. Um, I maybe it needs to. I know that statement about acting in the best interest of the health benefits program. I I think I'm gonna hopefully help out staff and channel back something I've been hearing in the last couple of meetings, which is back to the issue we were talking about and the first belief, which is I think we're, we're trying to discipline ourselves to make sure that there's a direct impact on CalPERS and everything that we do. AKA, for example, <coughs> it's one thing to care about the plight of senior citizens who are gonna lose their long-term care if we massively cut Medi-Cal. It's another thing to focus on vast systemic reform of Medi-Cal and its direct negative impact on CalPERS from massive cost shifting. Um, I, I thought what that really sp spoke to was keeping our advocacy focused on impacts on CalPERS and absolutely CalPERS ability to deliver for its members because of course, as we all know, massive cuts to Medicaid shift costs and shifting costs increases costs to our members. Um, and that's, at the end of the day, I think why we care about that, at least institutionally, why we should care about that. Just one quick final comment on the sort of notion of splitting between our leadership engagement and advocacy. Um, I mean, I, I will say I think uh, it goes to show in the last panel shows that a lot like we do in the investment space, our leadership yields lots of benefits to our ability to be innovative and do things that we otherwise wouldn't do. But I, I just can't help noticing that as an advocacy strategy, those federal representative reports we get quarterly, if you read in the suggestions for CalPER strategy part of them, it almost always says engage with other groups like Pacific Business Group on Health, et cetera, et cetera. So the documents we get back to us in terms of strategic discussions meld advocacy and engagement together. So if we're going to split them out for the beliefs. Maybe we want to think about reverberating that out to how we, again, use the beliefs as guidance for staff and advocacy. And, and I'm, I'm pitching myself as agnostic on the question as to whether the two are the same or the separate. I'm just observing that our representatives treat the thing, treat the two as the same. 
JJ? Yeah, we're reacting. Microphone. It's hot. Reacting to something Alan said and also something Ron said, uh, frequently we see legislation that excludes CalPERS. And so we say, well, that doesn't impact us, so we're not particularly concerned about it. But it often has an impact on the environment in which we operate. And I'm not sure how you incorporate that in here, but that's something we have to think about. Even if this bill does not specifically impact us, some of the drug disclosure bills, for example, they certainly impact the environment we operate in. And we have to be aware of that and maybe engage in some things that we are not explicitly excluded from um, because of the impact on the environment. Thank you. All right, seeing no other uh, requests, I do want to thank you for everything you were able to bring forward to us today. I know you got a lot of feedback through this, mm -hmm. but you brought quite a bit forward with not a lot of uh, input beforehand. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to also point out the next time that the employer community complains, uh, less than 3% of them responded. And I think that uh, they have to take ownership of that. And I'm not talking about you, Richard. But I mean, when, when less than 3 percent when less than three percent, <laughs> when when only three less than three percent actually participate, the onus falls back on them as well, and I think we need to make a note of that, uh, and maybe they need to because I noted on there that it said you that the surveys went to where their employer bulletins go, probably tells to tells you why they're not reading the bulletins either. Maybe the employers need to find someone else to channel that information. Mr. President and members of the board, I just want to sincerely thank you. I, I know. Um, you know, this was the first draft and we just really appreciate it. It's, you know, this was information we had collected, but the information that you shared today, the, the things you liked, the things you didn't like really will help us continue to refine this because this really is a set of beliefs for all of us. And I just want to thank all of you for um, your frankness, your directness, and just be able to allow us to move this forward. I did want to ask because the thought was to take this information and then refine and then come back for a vote. The question that I'd like to ask is, would you prefer us doing a workshop maybe in September and really get you more involved before then we would do a vote just to make sure that we're, we're hitting the mark. So I, I, if I've, I'm seeing a lot of shaking the head, but Mr. President, I'd like I to I think that's probably a, a safer place for you as well. It'll make it a little bit easier when you get to voting time, I think. All right, thank you, no Mr. More President. more engagement. Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much. Just a nice round of applause, please. Great job. So that, this concludes our sessions on health care. Uh, we appreciate all the information that came forward today from both presentations. Uh, when we return this afternoon, we're going to shift our focus to the enterprise performance reporting. Uh, now we're going to take an hour break for lunch. We'll be back in here at 1.30. <laughs>